between uh, World Data Systems and the RDA Group for Data Publishing. And um, we uh, wish you a warm welcome. The good news of today is that uh, we have a house that is completely sold out. So we will be managing probably around 100 people uh, attending. I see the number quickly going up now and approaching 30. And uh, I also expect in the next 10 minutes that that will go up a little higher. Uh, because we have so many people, I have a few logistical issues for you. And uh, uh, the first one is that uh, we will be taking questions and answers only in writing. Otherwise, it becomes very uh, difficult to manage so many uh, people in the audience. So please use the Q&A box on your interface if you have a question. And we shall be dealing with the questions after each session. In this uh, webinar, uh, we like to update you uh, on the work of four working groups that we have under data publishing. And uh, there will be first an introduction by Michael Diepenbroek of Pangea. And after that, each of the working groups will explain what they're doing and what they wish to achieve in the coming year one and a half years, and um, each of these groups represents the four legs of, uh, of this initiative. There will be uh, a talk on workflows for data publishing by Elizabeth Newbold of uh, the British Library. There will be a talk on bibliometrics by Sarah Callaghan of STFC. There will be a talk on linking services by Hilke Coors of Elsevier. And we will have a talk on cost recovery by Simon Hodson of CoData. All these speakers are eagerly awaiting to get the floor. So I shall quickly move myself away and um, give the floor to Michael Diepenbroek of Pangea, who will present you a general introduction of how all these activities fit together. Thank you. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, so, um, as you all know, the topic for today is publishing data. So, as we see it, the scientific data and the publication of, uh, of data needs to be an integral part of scholarly publishing. So, that is the ultimate goal. Um, the group um, behind uh, our initiative has, has grown over the last uh, years quite significantly. So, as an introduction, um, again, uh, regarding the long tail of data, you might be familiar with this uh, figure. Um, when you see here on the left side these professionally managed and published data, mostly those uh, which are really well structured, uh, having good infrastructures, professional infrastructures underneath, they are dealing with data from large-scale monitoring or computer data or larger disciplinary data centers. So this is all well-funded in general and, uh, and well-set. When you uh, see the next part, which is the uh, more yellowish part there, this is what I would call unmanaged open access data. Uh, these data are, um, yeah, I think best maybe reflected by institutional repositories. So, My Michael, Michael, yeah, Michael, sorry to interrupt you, but you, you're not advancing the slides. Can you please um, advance the slides oh, yeah. so that the participants can see your slides? I, I've moved now in full screen mode. Is that okay? Or um, hold on a second. I think. Um, yeah. Do they see that? No, not not yet. Just a second, please. Uh, I was yeah, not on the on the correct. I was not on the correct. Uh, My Michael, <laughs> Michael, you're you're now the presenter, so you might. Uh, continue okay, you're not on the correct, Michael. Okay. <laughs> okay, back to to the. Um, to the first slide and uh, the second slide, the long tail of data. So everything, what I was uh, telling here about the green part, uh, you might have gotten. 
And uh, the next is uh, the unmanaged open access data. Uh, this addresses uh, essentially those data from institutional repositories uh, which are fire-based and which are furnished by uh, with some metadata. So DSpace systems and similar things are uh, covered by that. And uh, that is, I think, maybe the largest part, these unmanaged and non-public data which are not accessible by, uh, at all and which are mostly data from individual scientists, labs, or small projects. Uh, so what they keep on their individual personal um, storage devices, uh, which is not accessible at all. So this is actually what we are dealing with, and in part uh, the yellowish uh, section. Um, again, as a revision here, some of the prerequisites for data publication. Uh, sure, we all we need licenses and uh, persistent identification. Uh, prominent are here, uh, for example, the CC license, Creative Commons license, or the Digital Object Identifier, DOIs. Um, quality is a very uh, important aspect. Um, that is, we need quality assessment and quality control procedures, actually review procedures comparable to those uh, was um, applied to literature. Um, so this is a very important aspect, um, whereby it needs to be said that it is not so essential that uh, we need high quality data, but that the quality of the data supplied can be estimated. And the last point I would like to stress in particular, that is efficiency. That is, data and metadata need to be interoperable. They need to comply to content standards. That is, uh, they need to be machine readable. To uh, visualize this, uh, look here on the right. Um, imagine you have an institutional repository uh, storing the myriads of files uh, with different MIME types, and each of those files, uh, files having uh, also semantics inside. Uh, that needs to be disentangled. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, seeing the requirement uh, from science uh, that we are now going to large-scale approaches, interdisciplinary approaches, and seeing the task uh, that uh, someone has to compile up all those files into something that could be used, for example, as a constraint for a, for a, a model or uh, for some other applications, so um, that is a really tedious task and that might occupy people there for years to do this. So this is not very efficient. And actually what we need is uh, to harmonize the data and to store them consistently in, uh, in well-curated uh, places. This is what we call fitness of use. And this was already mentioned in the OECD principles and guidelines for access to research data in 2007. Uh, this is uh, often omitted when talking about um, uh, data publication and criteria. Okay, and the next one uh, that was already addressed by Evke Smith uh, in the beginning. So uh, the group uh, that we are dealing with here is are the is the uh, Research Data Alliance World Data System Data Publishing Interest Group. Uh, we would like to bridge the domains, uh, as I said in the beginning, between all those uh, smaller uh, uh, projects here, down here, scientific research projects, individual scientists, and those well-created professional e-infrastructures being built up uh, worldwide. Uh, through these groups uh, mentioned by IFCA, so publishing workflows, services, bibliometrics, and also uh, one group that uh, takes care of the cost compensation. Sorry, we need to move here. And very essential in this context is the collaboration between data archives and science journals. That is, uh, in trying to bring up uh, or to, to make data an integral part of uh, science uh, of scholarly publishing, uh, we need to uh, build linkages between science journals and data archives. In particular, or practically, uh, uh, we need to link the editorial workflows and we have to bring up services linking data and articles. 
the consortium that is behind our group is, um, well, as mentioned, has increased over the last two years significantly. It is uh, reflecting all the major stakeholders in this area, so research facilities, uh, data repositories, univers uh, universities, libraries, and uh, industry. And uh, so seeing the progress that we are already doing here in uh, our working groups and uh, seeing the consortium, uh, we are quite confident to make progress. So that was for my part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Papa? Michael. Mustafa, can you, can people hear me now? Yes, yes, Afka, we can hear you. Oh, very good, okay, because I didn't see a green dot in front of my name, but uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, let's see, I noticed there are a few questions in the, oh, I lost the panel. So, Efke, I move the priv uh, presenter privileges to Elizabeth, who is uh, next on the list of speakers. Okay, I just wanted to check if there were any important Q and A's. Uh, um, I don't see any for for the time being. Okay, good. Then we uh, then we move on, and indeed, as you say, Mustafa, our next speaker is Elizabeth Newbold of the British Library. And she's one of the co-chairs of the working group on workflows for publishing data. So, Elizabeth, please go ahead. Hello. Um, good afternoon, everybody. As um, Eska said, I'm one of the co-chairs and presenting this on behalf of my colleagues. So, this afternoon, we'd just like to go through um, what our objectives are of the Publishing Workflows Working Group, which is actually quite a mouthful to say, so I won't be saying that again. Where we are now in our process, what our next steps are, and importantly, how anybody would like to get involved with it. So our background and motivation has really come from the policy and pressures versus the lack of incentives for researchers, which Michael mentioned briefly um, a few moments ago. So at the moment, only a really small fraction of the research data is preserved and available for sharing and reuse. And often there's a very bare minimum metadata with there. We really think this comes from a lack of established or trusted services and workflows, not because people don't want to, but probably because they're not quite sure how to, or the processes aren't actually in place or not very clear. But we know there are established and there are emerging workflows with some very good examples and best practice out there already. We know that the earth sciences have a very um, strong history in this area, but we're also seeing more initiatives coming from across institutions and from publishers in the journal sense with data journals. So we're looking at how we can provide credit via citation mechanisms to help with this sort of incentive issue as well. So as we said, having information about workflows is rather crucial for people who are just starting out or are actually very established. And we think it's important for not just the people managing the data, but for the researchers to understand how their data may be published. So that could be published in the sense of publishing in a data journal, or depositing and publishing through a discipline domain repository, or their own institution repository, which brings together all the different stakeholders who support the researchers in this process. So what we want to look at are the options available in practice to open, for open science. So we're going to be investigating the practical aspects of workflows required to publish data, and we want to address the barriers to implementation to help establish supporting infrastructure for the different types of data publishing activities. So we're going to try and study and test workflows that allow efficient and reliable reuse of research data to enhance the possibilities for greater discoverability. And as I've said before, we want to look across all disciplines and across the many stakeholder groups. So this is actually reflected, I think, as you can tell, from our current working group members. And I apologize for anybody who's missed off this list, but we are growing as a group. You'll see we have representatives from the library and repository community in institutions and universities, from publishers who are publishing data journals, and from the researchers and research institutes and discipline repositories. Um, hopefully, we're covering all the stakeholders through representation of this group, but we're always on the lookout for anybody who may have missed as we said at the bottom, others are very welcome to join and there is information about that on our Research Data Alliance um, 
working group web page. So, as we said, our objectives are to provide an analysis of representative range of existing and emerging workflows and standards for data deposit. This will include citation and reference models as well. We want to be able to test key components and applications for new workflows and to illustrate the benefits of reference models to researchers and organizations. We'd really like to be able to sort of have a suite of guidelines out there which show the best practice with the different communities and to be able to share emerging knowledge. Um, and, and also we want to share experiences, perhaps what doesn't work as well as what we think does work well. Um, it's always good to capture the bad as well as the good. So some of the work that we've done so far is having um, walkthroughs of data publishing models. Um, these are just a couple of examples of what we've done. Um, these two actually show examples from different types of data journals. Um, this one on the, on the next slide. Um, we're trying to compare across disciplines, as we've already said, but also across the different m means of publishing. But that means looking at the similarities within the same type of publishing. So for example, this is one data journal, and this is another data journal that we've looked at. Um, so although they're the same type of publishing, they might not actually have the same workflow. Um, and then we also want to be able to compare those against um, publishing through repositories, and that's our next stage. So we have a detailed work program. Um, Michael mentioned quality assurance and quality um, control. Um, that's obviously a very key point for us about where that fits into workflows and who is doing the what and the when and how. Um, we always forget about whether things are very manual or automated. Um, I and mean, we would like to, to try and map all the processes and people involved. Um, excuse me. And then we want to test how a reference model could be implemented and tested for suitability in different scenarios. And that's something that we would really like to have people contribute um, their use cases to. So where we are now is we're, we're sort of surveying the landscape and we're trying to collect and categorize different workflow examples. So for example, we would very like to have people contribute to these areas. What we're doing is we have an open spreadsheet at the moment, um, the, the link is available, where we have um, categorized different elements of workflows from ones that we know, and we are trying to map um, into this so that we can then compare across the different categories to try and build a reference model. The sort of categories we are looking at are listed on the screen now. As you can see, they're fairly comprehensive, um, but we think we may have missed some aspects. Um, so if there's anything that we've missed, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're also a little bit concerned that it might get a, um, rather detailed, but we think that's important to track the detail because um, we don't want to overlook anything. Um, as I said, this is all held in the spreadsheet, and then what we're trying to do is break down the workflows to match these criteria. Um, we've got a nice list of workflows already from different um, domains and types of repository. We have some institutional repositories which tend to be multidisciplinary. We've got some domain-specific repositories which are international in scope, and we've got some data journals. We are actually quite light, I think, on the examples from the humanities and social sciences. We have at least two social sciences ones, but very few humanities ones. And we have quite a lot from the um, geoscience and environmental sciences. Um, at the moment, we're not sure if that's reflective of what's available um, and where the work is being done, or if we just need to look for some more in the other areas. So we're trying to gather those particularly um, and, and reach out to the different communities. But as I said, we want this to be representative as well. So if you would like to get involved, we're keen to have people contribute to the workflow analysis. Um, if you have a workflow that you'd like to walk through with us and, and map against the spreadsheet, that would be great. Or if you'd like to draw it out so that we can understand how it really works. Um, tell us what you think is needed for a successful workflow in your own institute or discipline. And um, if you're interested in actually learning from specifics and perhaps being a use case, some, perhaps you're new to this, starting out, and you would like to try and apply a generic workflow, that would be really great. So if you've got anything to share, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and so that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a nice, uh, clear and crisp story. We have time for a few questions. 
let me um, uh, let me repeat that if people have questions, that you can put them in uh, in the Q and A box on your uh, on your web interface. And uh, we have around 60 people now joining the webinar, so I'm sure one of you has a question. Uh, if not, then uh, oh yeah, here's one by Catherine McNeil. And she asks, I speculate that much of the issue of where reaches have workflow challenges are in the face of the life cycle acts with a repository. Is there any work on that? Elizabeth, is there in your setup room Ooh, for that, that particular I sorry, I'm just going back to the, the slides. I think that's a really good um the point. Um I think we've actually touched on it, but probably not in enough detail. Um, we, we, we're trying to map who's involved and where they are involved, um, but we haven't necessarily got a box about pre-deposit or ingest. So I will make a note of that. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And thank you, Catherine. There's a new question by Wendy Kozlowski. Hi, is this workflow study primarily happening at the point of journal article editorial work? Elizabeth. Um, no, definitely not. Um, this is not all about journals. Uh, we, we take publishing as a very broad sense, and that could be that you're publishing through making your data available in a repository of some kind, and not there may be no link at all to a paper um, at, at the stage of publication. And, and that's one of the things we're trying to capture as well, is whether it is standalone data that is published as data with no publication, as well as journals. So no, it's definitely not just about journal publishing. OK, well, that's good to know, because uh, we have a lot of participants uh, from data centers. So if you have good workflows to, uh, to contribute to this working group, uh, please do so. And uh, please contact uh, Elizabeth or one of the other co-chairs about that uh, uh, individually. Uh, I think it would be good if we um, if we move on now to the next speaking slot, and that is uh, Sarah Callaghan of STFC, and uh, she is one of the co-chairs of the group on bibliometrics. And um, so, sorry, sorry, Efke. Um, according to the order we have on the screen, it, it was Hilke. Just um, oh, it was Hilke. sorry to interrupt you. Okay, sorry. Yeah. In that case, we move to Hilke. No problem at all. Hilke is uh, the co-chair of the Publishing Services Work Group, and will tell us a lot more about how uh, a linking service between data and publications can be put into place. Hilke. I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much, Eivke. Um Assuming everybody can hear me well, if you see my lips speaking and you do not hear anything, then please let us know over the chat or the Q&A. Um, I think you're perfectly audible. Very good. There we go. Let me start also at the first slide. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are calling in from. Um, my name is Hilke Koers, and together with Adrian Burton, um, I am one of the co-chairs of the Data Publication Services Working Group, um, and I'll be very happy to give a quick overview in about 10 minutes of what we are trying to achieve, where we are, and, and what are the next steps. Um, obviously, 10 minutes is short, so there's a few things that I will just mention and uh, skim over a little bit, but we will also be making the slides available, so I do want to share them at least, that you are aware that this activity is taking place, and if it has your interest, that you have a point of reference to maybe uh, look back in and, and follow up if you, if you like. So probably a good place to start is to explain what we mean with uh, data publication services, because the word services can mean different things in, in different contexts. And, and really what this working group is all about is to try and find um, workflows, processes, arrangements, between the different players in the data publication landscape that are currently very much set up as bilateral arrangements. So between, for example, publishers and data centers, or data centers and <coughs> providers information, and really try to map out those processes and find opportunities to lift them to a more 
centralized or standardized model. So a service in the sense of having a, a, a central hub, a central system, a central standard where all of these players can connect to. So that rather than having a whole bunch of bilateral arrangements, um, there is a central resource that people can benefit from. Now, in principle, that can still be fairly broad. So these processes can happen at a lot of different places in a data publication workflow, including editorial or post-publication. Um, but to make sure that we also deliver something concrete at the end of the 18-month uh, working period, we have decided to focus our attention initially on a cross-referencing service between articles and data, or I should say publications and data. Um, so really, at the end, when things are published, how do we make sure that data and publications, data and articles are, are connected and that those connections are easily found and easily exposed? And really the reason for, to do that is make things more interoperable, uh, make the whole system much more efficient, and ultimately to create new tools and functionalities that will benefit people who publish their data, who share their data, and people who are looking for data and want to discover data. Um, so this is what I mentioned, the initial focus is this article data cross-referencing service. And at the very minimum, what that means is that we want to set up a central system, a central uh, web service that you can query and ask, here is a given article, what data sets are available that are relevant to that article, and vice versa, and ideally also relations between data sets, um, so, so data to data relations where those data sets can reside at very different places. Um, we, uh, if we do a little bit more, we also want to add additional metadata about the nature of that relationship. So has the data been cited in an article, for example, or elementary to the article, just to give two examples. And perhaps some additional metadata for the article and or the data set itself. But the specifics of that is exactly what we are trying to figure out at this moment. Um, so why is this a good thing? What is the, the value proposition? And this is what I took from our case statement that we have uh, submitted to the RDA. Um, for the, um, yeah, the, 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 the stakeholders in this data publication landscape, it'll make the whole process of pre creating and interlinking articles and data much more easy, much more scalable, less overhead. Um, and ultimately, that can create new kinds of tools um, uh, that operate much more comprehensively than the existing systems that we have for linking articles and data. This is a slide um, uh, that I took from a study that was done by Parse Insight in 2010, just to support yeah, this idea that, art, that, that linking up articles and data makes a lot of sense and it adds a lot of value. One, um, so so uh, there was a big survey amongst uh, more than a thousand researchers where they asked the question, do you think it's useful to link your data with the published literature? Uh, and uh, more than 80% of the respondents says yes. And, and also, I think that makes a lot of sense because in many ways, uh, organizing the data in the data repository adds a lot of value. Um, but at the same time, it makes sense to have that immediate connection to the articles that, that, that are related to the data. So yes, this is a good thing to do, but we should also be mindful that it's important to do it right, and it's sometimes not easy to do it right, so there are real challenges with setting up that infrastructure. And to illustrate that, I took a figure from a publication by Peppa et al., where they, they did a survey of articles that have been published, and just looking for data that is linked through URL, so, so hard-coded URL links. Um, and then they looked back in time to see what percentage of these links was still active and still operational, so still valid links. And you see that if you go back to uh, 2000, so that's not even that long ago, almost half of those hard-coded URL links were broken by now. And there can be many reasons for that. Um, people have moved to another institute, uh, the data repository has changed, et cetera, et cetera. But just supplying the hard-coded link is not the best way to do it. Um, and yeah, we, we, we need to set up an infrastructure to do things a little bit better. This is just one example um, from my own experience at Elsevier um, of how it can be done a little bit better than by uh, hard coding URLs. Um, what you see here is a linking collaboration that we have set up with uh, Pangea, where if you read an article online on Science Direct and Pangea has data for that article, we display that in a small data viewer next to the article. 
and vice versa at Pangea there is a link to, to the article so this is really bi-directional links and even a little bit more with uh, visualizing the data next to the article. So another way to put the objective of the group is really to connect the dots. We know that many people have some insight into links between articles and data. At Elsevier, for example, we have a bit of the puzzle. Many uh, data repositories know how their data is used in articles. Uh, but these are all yeah, small perspectives on, on the big puzzle, if you like. And, and really what we're trying to do is bring that together. And I think it's really a yeah, classical example where one plus one can be a little bit more than two. So getting together all the knowledge on these existing article data links, combining all of that and exposing that as a service that is much more comprehensive and also much more uh, standardized than all the existing systems. Um, so that's really the uh, deliverable that we want to do. At the end of the, uh, of the period of, of the, the working time for the working group, we want to set up an operational cross-referencing service that will be beta release initially with a limited scope and limited content, etc. But really something that should already demonstrate the value in this, together with a set of recommendations on how this should be run and organized in, in the long run. And then in addition to that, also recommendations on other services or that, 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 that group set up. So what other processes exist and what other workflows exist apart from linking articles and data that would be right to be lifted from this uh, from a set of bilateral arrangements to a service type of infrastructure. So where we are right now, just a brief status update. Uh, we have been quite active over the last couple of months in several uh, directions. We wanted to set up uh, a list of guiding principles about the, the openness of this, uh, of this endeavor <coughs> and also how we would see the long-term management and governance of the, uh, of the linking service. So this is really more of a uh, policy principles, if you like. Um, we have presented the draft version of that at the last RDA and are planning to, uh, to formalize and ratify that by the end of October. We have started by building a test corpus of all these article data links by uh, uh, bringing together contributions from the people, uh, from, from the different parties that are active in this effort and that are contributing. Uh, we have begun to work on a draft technical infrastructure, and we've done quite a bit of outreach through webinars, et cetera, and interactions with other groups that are working on similar things. Uh, and of course, this webinar is an example of that. Because I think apart from the technical work, what is really crucially important is to really get buy-in from all of the uh, and support from all of the main stakeholders. Because a central service, uh, it, 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 it only becomes a standard if really all the, uh, all the people who benefit from it uh, we'll, we'll work with this. So just to run through really quickly, mindful of the time, um, of these different uh, areas where we have made progress. This is a draft version of the principles. Um, I just wanted to show them. There's a link to a Google Doc, and we will be uh, sharing these, uh, these slides as well, so you can take a look there and leave your comments. Um, but really what we try to do here is lay out uh, the open character of this endeavor and also how we, you know, what our current thoughts are on the, the long-term sustainability and governance of this service. In terms of the corpus, this is a list of the organizations so far that have chipped in some of their knowledge about article data links and we're now trying to bring that all together. If you, uh, if, if, if your organization also has uh, knowledge about links between articles and data, you would like to contribute them please be in touch because uh, the more the merrier and we would uh, very much welcome additional contributions. This is a slide of the draft technical infrastructure and again I've put the link here so that you can review that uh, at your leisure if you want. But the key point that I wanted to make is that we realize that at this moment a lot of the, you know, how, how the, uh, the article data links are captured by different organizations is, is very different. It's not very standardized yet, so we will have a range of ways to take that content, to ingest that, then process it and centralize it, and then expose it through, uh, through a central service, which will have both machine-readable components, so like an API, but also a web interface where, as a, as a human, you can log into and, and do a search query like, here's an article, what, what data sets do you, uh, do you know about that are relevant for that article? We're also thinking about the data model that is comes back to the, uh, the earlier statement about what kind of information are we capturing around these links. Um, and this is all very much work in progress at this moment. 
really trying to figure out you know, what is really the metadata that we need to store in this service and what is metadata that we should perhaps leave to others to organize. Um, this is the list of the current membership and like Elizabeth I apologize if some people are missing because people are signing up to the uh, RDA website quite regularly so I may have missed a couple of people but I think really the point that I wanted to make is as the whole data publication interest group and all the working groups we really have good representations of all the different stakeholders so people from research people from data centers from publishers but also infrastructure providers like data sites and Crossref and open air uh, are also very much engaged in this. And that is my last slide. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I don't know if there's time for questions right now or at the end, but I will be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Hilke. I'm not sure if people can hear me because I muted myself, but I seem to be unmuted now. So I assume yes, you are. Ah, very good, thank you. Um, Hilke, uh, you had a very clear talk and very interesting because two questions came in already, but one was already answered during your uh, talk itself. That was about the, the brokering uh, uh, service. Uh, but the other question is about the relation with Crossref. Crossref appears on some of your slides and has also a representative in the working group. Can you explain a little more what the uh, relationship with Crossref entails. Yeah, yeah, very happy to do that. So Jeff is uh, one of the active, uh, Jeff Builder from uh, Crossref is one of the active participants in this working group. Um, people may have noticed that recently Crossref and DataSite have also uh, uh, launched a service that interconnects or yeah, cross-references uh, uh, articles and data if they both have DOIs. Um, so clearly that is something that's also yeah, very much um, similar in terms of the objectives. The, the scope is a little bit different because this is really DOI, DOI linking, and we are also thinking about other accession numbers and also uh, getting the links from other sources of content. But this is definitely one of the elements that yeah, would ultimately contribute to this, uh, this wider infrastructure. Exactly how it fits into um, into the, the technical infrastructure that we are, uh, are intending to set up. We are uh, very much discussing that at this moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, this will definitely be one of the elements that, uh, that is going to yeah, take, take part in that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? We still have time for questions. So uh, if people have something that they like to raise, please use the Q&A box and type your question there. I do not see anything coming, so then now is the time that we can uh, go to Sarah. Sarah, I already uh, introduced you a little bit too early, but now is really your, uh, your slot. Sarah Callaghan of FTFC is one of the co-chairs of the Bibliometrics Group they're carrying out a survey, and I'm sure Sarah is going to tell us more about that. Uh, Sarah, please take the floor. Thank you, Eska. Okay, I'm hoping people can see my slides now. Um, so along with, uh, along with Kirsten Lennert, who's um, based at the University of Columbia, um, I'm co-chair of the Bibliometrics Working Group. And uh, um, our group is looking at bibliometrics for data. So um, bibliometrics are more commonly thought of in terms of the uh, publications um, world where they apply to um, things like journal articles and books and the like. And bibliometrics are really um, quantitative measures to assess and measure the impact and the quality of a piece of research and of the researchers that produce it. And they do this by tracking and recording access and citation of scientific publications. Um, and of course, log being what it is, as soon as you put a number on anything to measure it, that measurement instantly becomes um, of use to uh, people who want to have hard figures for their justifications for advancing academic careers or um, providing funding for uh, research. Uh, so basically, Bibliometrics is all about evaluating the attention that scientific publications receive within the scientific community. But as we all know, 
there is more to uh, science than just publications. We want to apply it to uh, other research outputs as well, such as data. So commonly known examples of bibliometrics are the uh, Science Citation Index, which apply to individual articles, the H Index, which applies to researchers, and Impact Factors, which applies to journals or which apply to journals. We want to apply bibliometrics to data. Uh, in other words, we want to come up with quantitative measures for the use, utility, and impact of data. And we want to do this because we want to encourage the ch culture change that's required so that the researchers and people who m work with and manage data are properly appreciated and recognized, uh, both um, from, for the work they do, but also within their institutions. And we want to raise the value of data acquisition and sharing and encourage people to do that data acquisition and sharing and data curation more effectively uh, and more efficiently and better. And once that's all done, once data is shared more often, once the metadata that it goes with the data is shared and is improved, that improves science um, and research as a whole. So at the moment, we're not really um, able to use existing metrics to apply them to data. Um, even though people have been putting a lot of time and effort and energy into promoting and coming up with methods of uh, um, using data citation as a method of uh, tracking the impact of data, it's still not yet common practice enough, although it is getting more common. Uh, everyone, I hope, will have heard of the uh, joint principles for data citation. Um, and uh, the CoData Task Group on Data Citation. If you haven't, go look them up. Um, they're very good. Um, and uh, these principles exist now, and now we're moving on to the stage of kind of promoting the principles, but also uh, coming up with ways to implement them. Some data repositories are better than others when it comes to um, publishing data and um, implementing formal procedures for citing data. But um, even the ones that have already given guidance on how to cite data held in their archives, there are still issues with data sets in terms of, um, well, how do we define what a data set is? What sort of granularity should the data set be cited at? All that sort of thing. Um, so this is an issue that's going to keep on going, but I do feel like we are making serious progress with it. So the goal of the group is to conceptualize data metrics and the services that are needed um, to actually have data metrics in common use. And it, when we're conceptualizing those services, we need to understand and overcome the barriers that uh, are stopping us from doing what we, need, what we need to do. So to do that, we're looking around and surveying the landscape, um, looking at data citation practices, new and emerging ones. Um, we're looking at uh, the necessary organizational and cultural changes that need to be made in the scholarly publishing system to foster data citation as a common um, occurrence. We also have to look at uh, possible models about how data use and citations can be tracked and measured based on existing and emerging approaches, like, uh, for example, the Thomson Reuters Data Citation Index and also the work that people have been doing on odd metrics. And of course, um, we have to know where we're going and we have to know what is going to stop us. So what barriers, what possible barriers are there for the implementation and adoption of data citation and data metrics? Uh, again, I will follow uh, Elizabeth and Hilke and say that uh, this is a list of the members of the group. Um, the membership is, of course, open. This list is probably already out of date. Um, so uh, apologies to anyone who uh, doesn't see themselves on it and know that they are a member. Um, for anyone who is not a member and would like to be, you are very, very welcome to join us. Uh, so please go to the Working Group webpage on the Research Data Alliance site and uh, click on the button that signs you up to the list. Or contact me or Kirsten, who's my other co-chair. So um, the main work that we in the survey, uh, sorry, the Bibliometrics Group have been doing is we have issued a short five minutes long um, survey and it's asking groups of questions. I think there's 11 questions in total. Um, and these questions are roughly grouped into areas um, being along the lines of uh, asking researchers or the people who are responding to the survey um, 
effectively who they are, whether they're a data producer or a librarian or a repository manager or a journal, um, journal publisher, um, asking them what uh, area of research they're actually in. So for example, in science or earth sciences or chemistry, engineering, biology, medicine and biomedical research, librarian and digital curation, and that, um, that question is free form, so you can pretty much put down whatever you like. Um, the survey was launched at the beginning of September. It is still open. Um, as of the 17th of September, when I actually put the slides, these next few slides together with the uh, graphs on, we had 63 responses. Um, that's gone up to over 80 now, but I would encourage everybody to uh, please, if you are anyway interested in this at all, um, do please go to the survey and tell us what you think about bibliometrics for data. The survey link is still, or the survey is still live, and the link is available up there at surveymonkey.com. Uh, and as I said, it only takes five minutes to complete, so it should be very quick and easy. I understand that people get asked for surveys, ask questions about surveys all the time. So as I said. Um, we started off by asking people who they were and how long they'd been doing research in their area and what area of research they were they were in. Um, and then we moved to ask them questions on how they currently evaluated the impact of um, their data. And these could be things uh, like um, data citations, um, data downloads, counts, and mentions in social media, that sort of thing. Apologies, the text on the um, x-axis in these graphs is quite small and I'm having trouble reading it. Uh, we also asked people if the methods they were using to evaluate the impact of their data actually met their needs or not. And there'll be no surprise there to see that the, the no's outnumber the yes's quite substantially on that question. Although, as I said, it is still early days and this is um, open to change. <laughs> And then we asked people what would they like to use to evaluate the impact of their data. And uh, they came up with, um, or we suggested a number of things. Uh, oh, sorry, not what do they want to use, what, why do they want to evaluate the impact of their data. And these were quest um, suggestions like funder requirements or promotion and tenure or plain and simple curiosity. And the last lot of questions was asking people um, what do you think needs to happen in the future to evaluate um, data more effectively? Um, and we collected a load of suggestions, and there were quite a few that actually came up um, repeatedly from lots of different people, and data citations was by far and away the most popular one. Um, there was also interesting things that came up in these questions. Um, people really want a metric that is, shows the actual use in professional practice what people are using the data for. Um, and uh, they also want well-regarded indicators, something that the community can really stand by and support. Um, in terms of things that are missing or need to be created for bibliometrics to become data used, or data, bibliometrics to become widely used, the most popular suggestion was by far and away culture change. Um, we need to change the scientific culture and the research culture so that data citation and metrics for data are the norm. Um, another, other suggestions were principles and standards for consistent practice have to be um, developed and enforced uh, so that people can work together and can uh, standardize and harmonize with each other. People also want mature tools for data citation, publishing, discovery and impact analysis, and openness for data. Uh, came up quite a lot as well in terms of open access and the like. So just a quick look at the time plan for the working group. Um, so we are currently uh, at the, we've hit, hit milestone two, which is the fourth RDA plenary, where we uh, presented the preliminary survey results to the working group. Um, we're going to keep the survey open for a little while longer, so again, please do go and fill it in if you're interested. And uh, we're going to take the survey results and um, look at what they say and uh, use that to inform the directions of the working group next. But it will involve developing recommendations, digging deeper into a few case studies and examples identified by the survey, 
um, and then coming up with suggestions for requirements and use cases that we can then take forward, um, probably not in this working group, but in another working group that um, we can take forward to implement, actually implement them in the future. So again, I'm going to say a please, or I'm going to um, put out a plea, please fill out the survey and please also get in touch with us if you think we are missing anything. Are we missing stakeholders? Are we missing relevant initiatives to engage with? Are we missing something when it comes to um, bibliometrics for data? Is there something out there that we just have, mi have missed or don't know about? Um, and any information or suggestions on how we can improve our approach and outcomes all are very, very welcome. So uh, yeah, please join us. Please fill out the survey. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Uh, while you were talking, two questions have come in already. Uh, the first one is by Valerie McCutcheon, if I pronounce your name correctly. Um, and it says, uh, this ties in with a number of initiatives that they are also involved in. Is there a short lay summary of the remit of the group and the goals? Uh, well, there is on the WDS website and on the RDA website, but maybe uh, you're, uh, you want to ask something different. Uh, the slides of all these presentations will be <coughs> on the WDS website, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, Sarah, do you want to add anything to this? Do you have an overview somewhere of initiatives, um, or, or are you planning to have that? <coughs> Uh, not, um, well, we're still collecting information. Um, the, there is a short, the short lay summary of the remit of the group is um, effectively the case statement that's on the RDA website as well. Um, we are collecting, yeah, um, if you could provide information about these initiatives through the survey, then that would be really, really helpful. There's one of the questions is um, tell us if, if there is something um, already available that um, we don't, well, that we, might be useful to us. Okay, very good. So again, everybody who hasn't done the survey yet, please do it. And more questions are coming in. Sarah, what are your thoughts on TC0? And the way it's uh, asked yeah. to refer uh, to site or attribute. Please. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. Um, yes, CC0 is making the data available. People can do whatever they like with it. They don't have to tell you anything. Um, they can just take it and run. Um, most data is put out, well, I don't know. Um, if data is on Figshare, it's put out under CC0. We're a bit more inclined towards CC BY as a, um, as a license, um, simply because um, it provides a bit more of a push to people to actually um, attribute the data that they've used. There's nothing stopping anyone from citing a CC0 website or um, CC0 um, data set. Um, and I think ideally we want to change the scientific culture so that every data set is cited regardless of what licenses is. Um, I hope that answered the question. Okay, thank you. There's a question uh, from Mark Parsons whether citations are the only metric being considered or can it go wider like educational applications, operational, policy use, et cetera, et cetera? Like yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're not just considering data citation. Um, we're also looking into altmetrics. Uh, last week I was at the first altmetrics conference in London where um, I got a lot of information about altmetrics and the social side of metrics, um, our social media metrics, which could equally be applied to data. So yeah, we're not limiting it to um, data citation. We're looking at everything we possibly can think of. And I have moved the, the slides back to the uh, survey results where you can have the, uh, the survey link there. Excellent, because that would uh, uh, answer a few other questions. And also, the link to the case statement has just been added to the Q&A section. So, um, that's very good. Oh, Mark Parsons has an extra question. Altmetrics is very broad. Do you mean mentions in social media, or does it also go yes. wide? 
Yeah, we're talking about things like, um, so we're talking about tweets, we're talking about mentions in blogs, Facebook likes, we're also talking about things like um, bookmarks in, men, in um, reference manager systems like Mendeley. Um, so yeah, we're trying to capture as much as we can in as many different ways as we can. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Let's hope that this will I, I see, brings this. Okay. Yeah. I, I see one more sure. uh, one more question by Herbert. Um, how oh, much prominence is given to Thompson Reuters DCI within your group? Um, at the moment, I can say we are aware of um, the data citation index exists in index's existence, um, but we're just looking at it from the point of view of one of the possible options for um, for providing data citation metrics. We, we uh, we're aware of it. It's not. Um, it's not the first thing. It's. N it's not the be all and the end all. We are looking at it, and we're looking at other things as well. Okay. Very good. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. Let's hope that this work brings the incentive for uh, researchers to share, cite, and use each other's data much, much more. And uh, this means that we're uh, already at the last talk of this afternoon, and that will be uh, Simon Hodson, the Executive Director of CoData, and he will be uh, covering the uh, topic of costs recovery. And as we all know, uh, many things are bound to die out if there's not a good economic model behind it. And Simon Hodson and uh, his group are working on exactly that. Uh, Simon, the floor is yours. Can we see if we can hear you? Okay, thank you very much, Efka. Can yes, you hear me very, okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Right. So please, uh, that, go that's, ahead. that's a relief. And, and you can see my slides as well. <laughs> we can see your slides also, yes. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much for that introduction, Efka. Yes, uh, cost recovery, business models, the financing of data centers is clearly an important, fundamental, and concrete issue, um, which this group is trying to look into in the context of the broader umbrella of work on data publication. So we aim to make a strategic uh, contribution to strategic thinking in this area, and to do so by conducting research to understand the current ways in which data centers are financed, in which they undertake cost recovery, and to look into the possible options for those strategies into the future. I need to clarify some of the terms here. We're talking about cost recovery. When this group was originally planned as part of this cohesive set of activities around data publishing, I think it was felt that it was important to have something to look at cost, because that's the, the bottom line, basically. But we're aware that there's quite a lot of work being done about cost models, about where costs are incurred for data centers. And by data centers, I mean data archives, the, the guardians, the people to, uh, looking at the stewardship of data in the long term. So there's quite a lot of work on cost models, but it would be interesting to look about look at business models and specifically cost recovery, the way in which data centers receive payments for particular activities or, or, or services. So nevertheless, within the broader umbrella, we want to include within that this consideration of involvement in data publishing activities and to examine whether there are new opportunities for expanding business models in that direction, but that's not the whole of, of the, the study which will be undertaken. So the background to this, why we think it's important, is this fundamental question of the concern that basic stru structural funding of data infrastructure may not keep pace with increasing costs and with an increasing volume of data. And I think we're all very aware of that threat that leads to that challenge. So we need to consider alternative cost recovery options and potentially a diversification of revenue streams for uh, data centers. And 
we often talk about, okay, who pays? Who pays for data infrastructure? Who pays for public access to research data? Who pays for the long-term curation or stewardship of that data? But we think it's important to break up that question a little bit. It's important, but it's important to look at the way in which payments are made and to analyze what data centers are paid for and by whom. And we'll go into, as I go through the presentation, some of our initial modeling of this, because there are different types of income streams, different types of payments which data centers receive. So the objects and deliverables of this working group are, um, are a little bit different from the others in, in that it's primarily a report, a contribution to strategic thinking on cost recovery. And that report will, possibly in the form of a, a position piece or a white paper, will provide conclusion, provide an outline of our findings, but also provide conclusions and recommendations about the appropriateness and the opportunities that there are for different cost recovery models. And we hope that this will be a useful, practical guide um, to help data centers in their thinking about it. We, we don't believe that we can offer a blueprint, provide all the answers to these issues, but we think we can help data centers and in dialogue funders think about the sort of payment models and cost recovery models which may be most reliable reliable and appropriate. So what business models exist, what are already being tried out, and we have evidence, we, we know that a number of data centers are out diversifying their income streams. So what are available for data centers that provide public access and what options are open? What approach, uh, approaches to funding are available that might help in the long term ensure the sustainability of data centers? So this cluster, this look network of questions and sort of things that we're connected to. So our activity, um, in order to keep control of it, uh, to keep it um, constrained and, and targeted, is divided in that traditional way into work packages. Um, the first two are really desk research um, based upon existing knowledge to provide the context for the report. So a summary of the current work on cost models, drawing on existing work, and that provides the balance, the basis for, the, for our ongoing um, activity and research. Um, and also, from the other side, the, the summary of current funding policies to the extent, extent that they do um, provide any clarity in the way that data infrastructure should be funded. And then the most important and active areas of our, our, our uh, of our work. We want to undertake um, a survey by means of short structured interviews and focus groups on to understand the existing approaches to cost recovery for data centers and what business models may be available. And I'll talk about that um, a little bit on the, on the next slide and how we're currently planning to do that. And then on the basis of those interviews, we hope to do, or we intend to do a number of more detailed case studies um, so that we have a number of examples and perhaps ideally a range of possible, from that extrapolate a range of possible options which may be available. And then of course work package five is writing that up into um, a report and conclusions, um, something along the lines of a white paper on cost recovery options for data centers. And we hope that that will be useful and particularly useful for the audience involved in the webinar today. We, at the recent Research Data Alliance plenary, we held two sessions to discuss these ideas and to get feedback on our approach and hopefully validate some of our thinking. Um, so in those sessions, we discussed the four work packages and we focused above all on the planned interviews and the analysis of the payment model, which um, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show later in the, in the presentation. And we also had um, preparing the ground for the case study, a high level discussion involving a number of uh, uh, stakeholders, and which was really kicked off on the one hand by two presentations of 
innovative examples, which we, we think might be innovative examples of cost recovery and business models. One from Dance, which was presented by my co-chair in Vidilla, and the other one from ICPSR, the Social Science Data Center in the, in the, in the States, presented by George Alter. And ICPSR have done a, a, a number of studies on the business models and the sustainability of data centers, of course. And we also have the funded perspective uh, from, from the NIH. So that provided a model for how we want to take this research forward. And we did some brainstorming in that of alternative cost recovery models and funding models. So that leads to the approach that we're taking to try and analyze the income streams that data centers may have. And this is a simplified model, which we intend to use as the basis for our initial um, interviews. Um, so this really just breaks out the, down the sort of ways in which a data center providing stewardship in the long term for research data may receive income. Maybe be direct payment from an infrastructure funder, a research funder, a structural funding, a central contract, which is the, the red line there, number one. Um, the orange line uh, signifies hosting support for institutions. So RPO um, is research performing institution. So the institution, an institution in which research is being conducted may make a payment by an annual or otherwise contract to a data center to look after the data um, being produced in that institution. And that's a model that's already being tried out, for example, in the Netherlands by DOLS. Um, so I got those mixed up. That, I just spoke about the green one there, the annual contract from the depositing institution. Um, the hosting support is, uh, I got a bit mixed up there, for, for which apologies. So hosting support is often data centers may be hosted in a research performing institution and therefore receive a form of finance in kind or even direct finance for, for some of their staff or activities by that host institution. And then the third one is the annual contract by a, um, with a research performing institution to data services. The fourth payment model or income stream is this idea of a data deposit fee, and that's something that we're particularly interested in, in exploring and looking at what data centers may be exploring that. Um, in one model, that could come from a research funder, a project funder. It's received by the, by the principal investigator or the research group in the research performing institution and is then passed on as a data deposit fee to the data center or archive and perhaps even mediated as part of the open access article process charge um, via, via a publisher. So that's a model which is being already used by, in part, by the Archaeology Data Service in the UK and by the Dryad Data Repository. So that is important to, to look at. The fifth income stream is the access charge. So pay to access. So in that instance, researchers who want to access the data would have to, have to pay. So this is the paywall model. And that is being used, for example, by the Cambridge Crystallography Data Service and has been for, for some time. We may feel that that goes against um, our principles of open access to publicly funded research outputs and research data. But if it's necessary to maintain the data infrastructure, then we, we have to consider and consider the pros and cons. And then um, a sixth model might be research data, a research and development project. So that's receipt of income from the project funder or the further development of services um, by the data center or archive. And that may lead to a seventh, which is um, not available here, which is charging for value-added services. So we, we may charge under number five for access to the raw data. We may charge for access to um, data integration services or cross-search or, or value-added services in, in general. So that's the sort of modeling that we've been doing, and we want to build our structured interviews around, around that model. And in the first instance, understand which of these income streams currently exist, which are being considered, and if the data centers are, are willing, and we hope they will be, to provide a broad 
indication of the proportion, the percentage of income which is received from each of these streams. And we think that will be very useful both for data centers and for research funders to understand the broader, the broader picture. And then that will lead into, as we say, to our more detailed case studies and into our analysis and in discussion with data centers and research funders, our conclusions and recommendations. So the next step is to finalize the payment model and the, and the structure of the interviews. We intend to, uh, to conduct those interviews um, in order to report on them, at least in a provisional way by the time of the next research data alliance plenary in March 2015. And it's at this point that I understand that many of the participants in this meeting, in this webinar, um, represent uh, providers of, of long-term data curation and data stewardship services, we're looking for volunteers. I put the, the dog there, the cute dog, which you, I'm sure you'll find a great difficulty in resisting that, that call for, for help. Um, I put that dog there because I was almost con convinced that Sarah would have used a, a cat in her presentation and we needed to rebalance her from the canine side. But we are very, very keen to have volunteers for those structured interviews. Time scales, as much as many of the others, we think this breaks up um, neatly into work and reporting and getting feedback ideally and research data alliance plenaries. We intend to report on the interviews at the next plenary on the case studies and the preliminary draft at the plenary in September 2015, um, after which, after that feedback, we'll polish up um, the report to be published sometime between um, September 2015 and March 2016. Um, this is a membership of the group, um, which, as others have mentioned, is um, already out of date as people have been signing up as a result of the meetings at RDA. Um, so thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Simon. And uh, the picture of your lovely dog has already worked, because in the Q&A, section people are asking how they can sign up so uh, i'm sure uh, it will be very popular uh, in your group very soon um we're running a bit over time apologies for that but i still see a lot of uh, people participating so despite the extra time uh, you have apparently not been bored and that is uh, good to see now now that we're running over anyway we have the possibility for one or two more questions Please um, add those in the Q&A box if you have them. And uh, while we wait for that, maybe Simon, I can ask you a question. In your contacts on, via this working group with data centers, how many data centers do you encounter that are struggling now already? Or is this more something that people fear for the future when the big tsunami of data will hit them? Yes, yeah, so I, I'm I'm not in a position to say um, to say what proportion are struggling. Um, if there are data centres struggling, then I think that's something which, at the moment, they keep to themselves. But I think more importantly, this is about planning for the future, and I think all data centres are concerned about the balance of payments and about diversifying income and concerned about that, that principal question at, at the beginning. It may not affect all research areas, but I think it affects many that the um, ongoing reluctance of research funders to have that consistent balance line in their, in their budget for data infrastructure, at least the reluctance to see that grow um, with the volume and the cost of, of, of data. And I'm certainly aware of um, a number of data centers with whom we've talked already that are under instruction to look for alternative business models, to diversify their income streams, to think about value-added services, to think about charging for deposit. Um, and I think a number of data centers are uh, thinking about, or I either have already implemented this or are thinking about it seriously. And so I think it's the moment to be doing this sort of research. Okay, that's very clear. Um, I do not see um, any other questions coming in, so 
apparently this is also very clear uh, for all the other people uh, joining this webinar. This brings us to the end. I uh, hope yeah. that Aisha, uh, Aisha, people. Aisha, sorry, can I just? Yeah. Oh, sorry, can I just just before you do you do wrap up? Can I just say if you would like to get involved, you can sign up in in one of two ways. Please send an email, as someone has already done, to myself and to Ingrid Diller, uh, the co-chair, mm -hmm. and we'll um, engage with you in that way. Or it's possible to sign up on the RDA website. Um, so okay. please do that. Yes. And we're very keen to have sign-ups like that so that we can engage with data centers um, for the first stage of this research. That is very useful. Thank you. And uh, I see that Mustafa has added links in the uh, Q&A box for how to sign up, also for the other groups. Uh, Everybody is really very welcome. The broader this initiative is, uh, the more useful the outcome of it. So uh, we hope we get uh, many more people. I also hope that you've enjoyed this uh, webinar and that it's been useful to you. We shall be doing many more webinars in the course of the work of our working groups. And uh, we would like to get your feedback, so please send us your feedback. You'll receive an email uh, where you can re return your feed that you can use to return your feedback to us, and that will really be uh, helpful for us. Uh, I see one comment here of Aslam Gumra. As a university, our funding comes from every project being top sliced. When we start talking to researchers in order to pay for these services, it makes it difficult to make the case not only to the research but to the university. Do you see this in any members? Simon, is this addressed in your uh, surveying? Yes, and um, apologies for not being explicit about that. Um, we're taking a wide view of what we mean by data center, and so we're including data services, data archives that are based in universities, and we're very aware of the issue about payments either through indirect costs or direct charging of research projects um, for data archiving within research performing institutions and um, universities. Um, and that's one explicitly one of the issues that we want to address within this. There's been some useful preliminary work um, in the UK on this by the uh, uh, Digital Curation Centre um, that held a, a workshop on this uh, about 18 months ago. Uh, if you look at funders' attitudes and how those that internal char charging, explicit charging as direct costs or recharging as indirect costs might might be managed in, in as transparent a way as possible, and we're aware that this is an important issue, not just in the UK but internationally. So we will be looking into it. Okay, very good. Well, then I think we should really wrap up now because we're nearly 20 minutes uh, late. Um, again, please send us your feedback. This has been recorded, so if you had to miss parts of it, you can look it back on the WDS website or on the RDA website. We'll be featuring this uh, as broad as possible. And um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. This webinar was held by the World Data Center and by the uh, Research Data Alliance. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.